Welcome. My name is Brian Miller. I'm an elder law attorney here with Littman Crooks. We have offices in Westchester and in Manhattan. Uh, we handle quite a variety of, of areas of elder law, trust and estates, Medicaid planning, Medicaid applications, guardianships, asset protection, trust wills and estates. And, and we're putting this together this program today. This is a program where I brought in a few um, colleagues from other areas of, of the elder care world to we are going to discuss what we call the blueprint for aging in place. I just want to remind people, for those that are just joining now, that we will be recording this program. Um, it is your choice whether or not you wish to remain your camera on or take your camera off. Uh, we do ask that everybody remain muted for the entirety of the program until we get to the questions at the end. If you have have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat box and we will go through the chat questions at the end of the program because we have multiple presenters. It does get a little tricky if we were to try to answer questions as we go through. We have no problem reading through all of the questions at the end um, or even taking live questions at the end if people so wish. I want to introduce a few of my esteemed colleagues today um, that we have with us. Um, uh, we'll start with from New York Elder Care Consultants is Debbie Dralek. Uh, Debbie, she's waving her hand. If you want to unmute yourself and kind of introduce yourself a little, tell them a little bit about what you do, and you will be hearing from her later on as well. Hi, and we are very excited to be participating in this panel with our colleagues as well. And I'm very excited that you are all here. I run a practice of geriatric care management, uh, myself and other social workers. And what we do is help people figure out what kind of help they need, how to get it, which includes how to pay for it, which is tonight's topic of conversation, and how to manage the challenges that arise as the years go by, as the weeks, years go by, as people grow older. So I'm really delighted to be here. And I hope that you will all glean a lot of knowledge tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And then next up, we have two um, professionals from InCare Home Care. Uh, they are a home care agency based out of New York City. I will first introduce Natalie Mazlumi. Um, Natalie, wave your hand if you want to unmute yourself and introduce Hi. yourself. Hi. Nice to meet you all. Um, I will let you introduce Megan also, my colleague Megan. Uh, we are a New York State licensed home care agency servicing the five boroughs in Westchester. Um, and, you know, we're very excited to be on this panel and to talk to um, each other about um, the reality of care going forward and how best to prepare for it. Thank you, Natalie. And then also from In Care Home Care, we have Megan Lupkin. Uh, she's waving. Megan, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Megan Lupkin. Thank you so much for attending today. Um, as you know, I work with Natalie. We're a licensed home care agency. We're smaller and intimate. We also are really happy to be speaking today about this topic. Planning is so important and really educating and being aware of everything and having that blueprint to move forward, which is a quite a process, but we're really going to help you make it a little easier today. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Now I'm gonna share my screen for everybody so we can begin the presentation. Um, and one of the things I, I would like to add is that while this program is talking about a blueprint for aging in place and, and staying at home um, while you age in place, one of the things that my colleagues and I discussed as we were putting together this presentation is while yes, this is a blueprint, but we all have clients entering this stage at different places. Some people come to the elder law attorney first. Some people go to the, the home care agency and the home care agency is like, you should really talk to an attorney. Um, or some people find geriatric care managers or elder care consultants like Debbie. And she's like, well, you need a home care agency or you need uh, an 
attorney. So it doesn't matter where you enter this stage. Um, it, it's really putting together a, a very cohesive team um, as you try to plan and then implement your, your, your aging in place. So with that, no further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Megan to begin the presentation. Megan? Hi, I just need my next slide. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to talk to you as we're dealing with a very serious topic today and as we're all um, analyzing and planning for the future, just remember everyone, you may be a senior, but you're still hot as Betty White is a living example of. Thank you, next. Today, we're going to talk about aging in the home and give a total overview of planning the finances, planning the care, and resources to supplement the care or fill in the gaps. We want you to take everything away in terms of that you have more education and a full picture of the whole process. If you look now, there's a tremendous boom. As of now, we have 47 million seniors, 65 plus in the US, and it's projected to double within 40 years. What is really resulting here is with all the medical developments and they will continue to evolve, we are really extending the lifespan. Whereas people thought they might live to 70 in the past, today, the population of 85 plus will triple by 2060. And we're seeing a trend and that might even be more so with COVID and the implications that 87% of the seniors in the US receive care at home. Next. And not to let this scare everybody, but it's an awareness factor. This is, that's why it's important to plan finances along with planning care, to have a general understanding. What are the costs? If I'm looking at protecting assets, what's the reality of what I need to do? So here is the overall care landscape. If you look at assisted living, which is the first step into some help in a monitored facility or community, you're seeing that it can range anywhere from 3,800 a month up to over 9,000. And when you look at, not to scare you, it can go up to, you know, a year might cost you over 110,000. Then if you look at care, home care, where it could end up being 24 hours a day, it can end up being two hours a day, you're looking, if you're figuring six, a little over six hours a day, you're going from something like over 4,000 to each month to 84,000 per year. And then if you look at a nursing home, which is the most skilled and you know highest form of care, you're going to look at if someone doesn't want to share a room. You're going to look at, at the median of 15,000 a month. It can go up with care and room size to 32,000. And really up there and, you know, more than a half a million spent each year on care. And when, excuse me, is everybody muted? Um, and there are true benefits of aging in home about, we speak about it. You do have more of the freedom. It's a comfort level. You're a really independent person and you're in the next stage of life. You wanna remain as independent as possible and have your privacy. You've looked to build your whole life. You've built a home with beauty, and all the treasures you've collected in your life. And you want to be in that environment. 
you're also geographically close to your friends and family, which provide great support. It also allows you to really customize your care versus some sort of community or facility that is more structured to really give you exactly a structure, a base, and how you can live within that base and get the care you need. But it's very interesting, research is indicating that it's really um, beneficial to live at home. We see 50% less doctors visit. The bottom line is longevity is really, you want to live as long as possible with a quality of life. And you're also, as we all look and see how many cognitive developments and, you know, everything from Alzheimer's or water on the brain or just dementia, we're seeing less advancement of this memory loss when you're in these familiar surroundings. Next. Next slide. And Today, we're going to really try to give you that blueprint of putting those pieces together to age in place. As we've all referenced here, we're here together to really stress how important it, has, it is to have a team within this planning process and implementation because there are many different aspects of planning where there are individuals with professionals with expertise that will be important to you. It's also, it's a lot, it's daunting to have a professional who can coordinate it for some sort of agency is key. And just in implementing your plan, it also, it takes all of us and the bottom line is advocacy. Having a team will help you advocate to get the best quality of life within your homes. As we're all speaking to you today, an elder care lawyer, Brian, geriatric care manager, Debbie, and Natalie and I from a home health care agency. And as they say, it takes a village. The starting point is a professional assessment of care needs. And the big question is also that I find everybody wants to see a straight line as to when you need care. And that doesn't always happen, but things like hygiene, safety, or some companionship are things that might dictate taking this type of step. So when you're starting, you need an assessment of the care needs. That comes from a social worker or someone like Debbie, who's a geriatric care manager, because you just want to have an, under, an understanding of what are the physical health needs? Where, does the, where is the cognition? Are there any mental health problems? And what about the environment you're living in? How does that lay out? And obviously, after this um, professional has assessed it all, and a nurse can do it as well, you develop, the professional develops a care plan because it's also what support is really needed. And because you're dealing with the professionals who provide the support, at what level do I need that? And this is something that is very important because I think a lot of times people will hire a home care agency or a care manager and not even know, well, what are the options? What can they do for us? And what do I exactly need and how much of it? And when you look at a care plan, do you need companionship? Do you need personal care needs such as hygiene, dressing? Do you need some light housekeeping or are you at a level to bring in skilled nursing because you want to set up something at home that would be more acute setting than 
going to a nursing home. And then also looking at the home, but it's from a perspective, not just for today, but as you age, if certain problems you want to anticipate or any issues, you might want to discuss and look at your home and make some modifications that'll make it simple. And you might want to purchase some equipment, which will make it easier. Next slide. And then when you're at the point after an assessment of implementation of care, there are two roads to go. You can go with a home health care agency where the agency is set up to provide caregiving and or an independent caregiver, whether it's somebody your friend recommends or something. There are care directories, which you can also look into that could provide someone who is not affiliated with a home care agency, a caregiver. And when we look at the home health care agency, there are advantages. Having that setup and structure can make it more easy to coordinate. I mean, um, communication is really key and getting all the pieces together. Also, the agencies do do vigorous screening of the candidates and have a background of making sure they have the best people. And they invest in training so these home health care aides will have certification. Also, in reality, someone, uh, caregiver aide might get sick. They might want to take a vacation. They might be the wrong caregiver for you. And an agency can coordinate that well. So to make sure you have somebody there always and to make sure it is the best person who fits your care needs and personality. Therefore, it's a continuum of care. And of course, billing is involved. Sometimes long-term care insurance is involved. And having that administrative support that you don't have to worry about paying for it. You don't have to worry about putting in paperwork and accessing insurance. So, but the disadvantages are a home health care agency does have a select pool of caregivers. So you're working within those parameters. You have um, this limited control because there is an infrastructure. Also, in working with an agency, there can be care minimums, like say it's four to five hours a day, three days a week. That's how you work. If you go the independent caregiver or directory, which I was explaining to you in a directory is somewhere that um, a service and an organization that has a larger pool of caregivers that might match you through demographics, conversations, so, and you're selecting your own caregivers. So you're, you know, with a home care agency, you might get involved, but you're really selecting your own caregiver and your family. There are more flexibility because you're dealing with that one caregiver who is working directly for you. So it's also can be a less expensive option. And it turns out that it actually gives these caregivers more money and uh, it's less expensive. The disadvantages are some of their, these home health aides may not be certified. Also, if somebody's absent, if somebody is sick for a while on vacation, you are tasked and your family with finding backup on your own. Also, the whole financial piece is yours and how you pay for, how you claim, how you take out taxes. And with these private caregivers, Insurance, the chances are 
insurance may not reimburse. So if you have a long-term care policy or a catastrophic policy, they might not, and especially if the home health care worker is not certified, they may not re reimburse you. And also you take on a personal liability because you're in charge. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan. So uh, Megan discussed a lot of different options and it all sounds expensive. And a lot of people come in here because they're like, well, how do I pay for this care? And I heard a long time ago, there are the three Bs to paying for long-term care insurance. You either have to be rich, be insured, or be poor. Um, so let's talk about paying for long-term care insurance. First is being rich. You can private pay for your care insurance. Now, you don't have to necessarily be rich. I mean, there are people, working class people that are make sufficient funds to pay for their care. Maybe it's not um, a, a, as needed as it will be later on, but we want to look at people's personal resources to private pay for home care. Um, and I do very first one put income from employment. People say, well, if I'm getting home care, I'm not employed. We have many clients who have spouses that are still employed and still in the workforce and are able to use spouses income or in resources um, to cover their care. Uh, you want to look at your retirement income, your savings and assets. Uh, people do use reverse mortgages to tap into equity of their homes um, to private pay for care. And then there's always the family and loved ones. There are many Many parents that have children that will pay for their care, or, or, or maybe they have their they have parents themselves um, that are paying for the care. I have seen that. But so the first way to pay for private care is to, to pay it yourself. That's not always the option. We know that. Uh, the next is there's insurance. Quite often we have people with long-term care insurance policies. This will pay for a, an aid or a nurse to come into your home or sometimes into a nursing home um, to provide your care for you. There's also catastrophic care insurance, which will pay for certain types of care, but may not always pay for long-term care. And then the final is government benefits. This is the being poor. And you don't have to be poor to apply for government benefits. That's where people like I come in who assist with asset protection um, and moving around your assets to make you appear poor on paper, even though you may not be poor, um, to uh, um, get government benefits. Now, there are government benefits. Some people are veterans. Maybe you're a veteran of a war maybe or a spouse of a veteran, maybe entitled to veterans benefits. Uh, people 65 or older or with certain health conditions can apply for Medicare or people that are, and I put in air quotes, poor, um, can apply for Medicaid to cover um, their care. And most people come into me and say, well, what is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? I've got Medicare, I don't need Medicaid. Well, there is a huge difference. While they both sound the same, they sound very similar, Medicare versus Medicaid, they are entirely different programs. Medicare is a government insurance program. Um, it's age-based, generally 65 or older are entitled to um, obtain Medicare benefits. It's federally administered. It's administered by the federal government. And the big kicker is it does not pay for long-term care. So everyone's, I have many, many people come in and say, I've got Medicare. I don't need Medicaid. Medicare will pay for everything. No, it will not. It does not pay for long-term care. Medicaid, however, is a government assistance program. It's needs-based, and I'll get into that in a minute, but needs-based means you have to financially qualify for Medicaid. Um, it's a federal, while it's a federal program, it's administered by the state. So it's administered by the state of New York. And the, the key here is it does pay for your long-term care. This is the program that if you going to need long-term care aides to come into your house for prolonged periods of time, this is the program that you will need to pay for those um, those aids, that home care, if you can't private pay uh, and you don't have insurance that will pay for that, then you're going to need to seek out some type of Medicaid benefits. Going back to Medicare, just again, it does not pay for 24-hour care at home. I, and I made this slide again because time and time again, people say, I have Medicare, I don't, I'm good. And no, you are not. It does not pay for 24-hour care doesn't have meals delivered to your house, doesn't cover homemaker services, if that's the only care that you need, um, doesn't co um, cover custodial care um, when that's the only care you need. And I cannot stress this enough, Medicare does not pay for long-term care insurance. 
So then what is Medicaid? You keep saying, well, I need Medicaid. Medicaid is what's going to cover my long-term care um, at home. Well, Medicaid, is, as we said, is a government assistance program. It can cover home and community-based Medicaid long-term care, sometimes called community Medicaid, or nursing home care, often called institutionalized Medicaid or nursing home Medicaid. Those are two totally different programs. One is for receiving care at home, that's community, and one is for receiving care in the nursing home. Um, we are here today really talking about aging in place at home. We may divert here and again just to show you a little bit about nursing home, because when we do our planning and we, we look at Medicaid, we always have to keep in the back of our mind, what happens if I can't stay at home? What happens if I get community Medicaid six months down the road, three years down the road, whatever it may be, I need to go to a nursing home. My mom needs to go to a nursing home. So we always want to keep that in the back of our head. And as I said, Medicaid is needs-based. So the eligibility, you have to be medically needy. I'm going to assume for, for today's purposes that most people here applying for Medicaid are going to meet the medically needy portion of this aspect. And you'll hear a little from Deborah later talking about some of the needs and the care um, from, from the geriatric care manager perspective. The other portion is financial needs. You have to both meet income and assets to qualify for Medicaid, whether you're applying for community or nursing home. So just a quick run through for community that pays for long-term care at home. And everyone comes into me says, well, I've, there's this five-year look back period I heard about. I, I can't do anything for five years. There is no look back period for community Medicaid at this time. Um, nursing home, there is a five-year look-back period. So what a look-back period is, when you apply for nursing home Medicaid, they look at all of your finances for the last five years. If you've made any uncompensated transfers, any gifts, anything that you can't show that you actually received something of value, something of fair market value for, Medicaid is going to presume that you made that transfer to qualify for Medicaid benefits and therefore hit you with a penalty period which is a period of time where Medicaid says, we're not paying for your care, good luck, you're on your own. When this penalty period expires, then we'll begin paying for your care. And so while there is that five-year look back period um, for nursing home, which could incur a penalty period, currently there is no look back period for community care. However, Last year, it was supposed to begin October of 2020, and now we're looking at January of 2022, and it's probably going to be even pushed back further. I've heard March, April, July, sometime in 2022, community Medicaid will be starting a 30-month look-back period where they look at your finances and transfers for the last 30 months, that's two and a half years, and if there's any uncompensated transfers, they will incur a penalty period where they will not pay for your community care. So if you're on the fence of do I apply, do I not apply, now's the time to start looking to apply because we wanna get that application in and filed with, with Department of Social Services before January 1 of 2022. Again, this may get pushed back to March or April or July of 2022, but right now, we haven't heard any definitive um, word of it being pushed back from January, so we're, we're working on that premise that these new rules will be implemented in January. Other, other changes that are coming down the pike sometime within the next year, again, possibly January, maybe later, I mentioned the 30-month look-back period, they are going to implement stricter care standards um, to qualify for community Medicaid. Right now, the, the the standards are quite lax. They're going to require that for community care that you need assistance with at least three activities of daily living. Or if you have a, a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, you'll need supervision of at least two activities of daily living. These are transferring, toileting, bedding, um, being able to change yourself, being able to wash yourself, things of that nature. Right now, those standards don't exist, but they are coming. Uh, so we're trying to, to encourage people, get your application in before these standards start, because it's going to get harder and harder to qualify.
um, they're going to implement a care review team. And generally, if somebody needs more than 12 hours of care per day, there is going to be what they call an independent um, care team or care review. And it's going to be an independent assessor. And these independent people, if you can see my air quotes, um, they're going to be working with Medicaid. So uh, put two and two together. And it's not going to be that independent. And it's going to get harder and harder to get your care. Um, they're going to have a care assessment performed by an independent physician who again is under contract with uh, the Department of Health. So these are all people, they're not your care, primary care physicians, not your doctors. These are people you've never met before that are going to be reviewing your case, going to be reviewing you and saying, yes, you qualify for Medicaid or no, you don't. Again, we don't know when the, the implementation is. The Department of Health um, has inferred that it's going to be sometime in 2022. Um, they have yet to put it in writing. Um, so we can't tell you exactly when because we're still in a pandemic and this still requires the approval of the federal government um, who's still operating that look, there's still a pandemic we're not approving anything just yet but some, sometimes in 2022 these new changes are going to be implemented so we're really really encouraging people that if you need this care apply now while, while the standards are much much more lenient so to qualify for community medicaid you, you heard that it's a needs-based um, and so for community medicaid the recipient is allowed to have assets in their individual name of $15,900. These are available assets, um, bank accounts, uh, 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 checking accounts, brokerage accounts, and anything um, that is in your name for a single individual is $15,900. There is a different scale for married couples where they're both receiving community Medicaid, um, but I don't want to go too far off, off course, so I'm really applying this um, to the single individual um, or the married individual um, who we can transfer all the assets to the spouse and, and file a spousal approval, and then they would qualify for Medicaid as a single individual, and I believe we'll get into that in a little while. There are exceptions to this $15,900 available asset limit that you're able to have. You're allowed to have a burial allowance of up to $1,500. What you can do with $1,500 in a burial, I still don't know. These laws were written in the 1960s and they haven't been updated, um, but it is a way to set aside a little bit more money than 15,900. You're allowed to have a life insurance with a cash value of $1,500 or less. I think I've only ever seen one of these in my lifetime because most people have life insurance with cash values much more than $1,500. Again, laws written in the 1960s and haven't been updated since. You're allowed to have personal property of an unlimited amount. Um, so your, your home furnishings, your, your wardrobe, uh, things of that nature, your, your personal property, you're allowed to have an un unlimited. However, if you've got uh, collectibles, if you've got uh, art collections or jewelry collections, that could cause a problem. It's something we'd want to address on an individual basis um, to ensure that uh, it doesn't prevent you from obtaining Medicaid benefits. You're allowed to have a primary residence of, with an equity value of up to $906,000. Um, this is really only for community care. It varies with, with nursing home care. You're still allowed um, that house with an equity value, but Medicaid could put a lien on it if you're in a nursing home. But you are allowed to have primary residence with a value up to $906,000 equity. Um, you're allowed to have a supplemental needs trust. Perhaps maybe you are a disabled person or, or something of that nature. You're allowed to have a supplemental needs trust. And you are in New York, and, and New York is different than many other states, you are allowed to have qual qualified retirement plans. Um, so long as they are in a payout status, they are considered exempt. And Medicaid cannot touch the principal of those accounts, they, but they will count the income um, towards your allowed income. So IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, things of those qualified retirement plans, you don't have to spend them down to qualify for Medicaid in New York. Other states you do, but in New York, you don't have to. We just have to make sure that they are in payout status. And then we only count the income um, when applying for Medicaid. So then what's the income that you're allowed? An individual in New York is allowed to receive and keep $904 a month of their income. 
It's not a lot of money, especially in New York, $904. There are ways um, to protect all the excess income, which we will get to in a little bit. And you are also still allowed to pay for your Medicare benefits and any other health insurance benefits that you may receive. In. Medicaid is a payer of last resort. So they really require that you continue to pay your health insurance premiums um, going forward. Anything above, as I mentioned, we'll get to look before you can put into a pooled income trust to protect your excess income. So what are your options? How do you protect? How do you save your assets? One of the biggest uh, tools we use um, when applying for community Medicaid is gifting. Again, there's no look back period currently. So you can give away all of your assets today and, and, and then apply and qualify for community-based Medicaid um, next month. As long as you're under that 15,900 by, by the first of the month, you will qualify financially for community Medicaid. However, you want to be able to undo that gift if you need to go to a nursing home within the next five years. Because as you may recall, there is a five-year look back for nursing home Medicaid. So if you give all your money away today, you may qualify for community Medicaid, but we get two years down the road, you need a nursing home. That's going to create a penalty period where you will not have money to pay for your care and Medicaid won't pay for it either. So how do we give money away, um, but protect it so that way it's there to be undone? One option we do is we call the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Um, and you could always give it to your spouse, your, your spouse or a child or something. Um, but again, if they're not able to return it, you're, you're, you're left high and dry. So one option we use is called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And this is a trust um, that will distribute income to you, but hold the property, um, and it, which avoids Medicaid from being able to attach the assets. This trust is irrevocable. It cannot be revoked. Um, the grantor chooses the residuary beneficiaries. So you're saying, look, I get the income from my trust while I'm alive. Then after I pass away, I want and whatever it is, maybe your child, your grandchild, the charity, whoever that may be, to receive whatever remains in the trust after your passing. This is, again, a way of protecting your assets um, for your loved ones. Uh, one of the caveats is the grantor and his or her spouse um, can only receive income. They cannot touch the principal. Um, we do usually put some carve out back doors to allow children to access principal. Uh, that's a whole other lecture I could go on for an hour with regard to these trusts. So we're really just briefly touching on this topic. And this also starts the clock on the five-year look-back period for nursing home Medicaid, which we discussed before. So maybe you're able to transfer your assets to a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Uh, you're home for five years. After five years, you need to go to a community. You need to go to a nursing home. Well, these assets that you transferred to this trust five years ago are all protected, and you will qualify for nursing home benefits later on. And if you do need to go into a nursing home within the five years, I know I said this trust is irrevocable. If it's drafted properly by a reputable, experienced elder law attorney, they can, those trusts can be undone and engage in some type of crisis planning for, for nursing home Medicaid. But again, that's another topic for another day, but this is really a way of protecting your assets, making sure that they can come back to you if need be, and they are protected from Medicaid. Um, so that way you can qualify for community benefits and after five years, nursing home benefits. So that's protecting the assets. Well, what about the income? You said, Brian, I'm only allowed to have $904 a month of income. I've got $3,000 a month. What can I do? How can I protect it? Um, well, we use what we call pooled income trusts. And these are trusts that the government allows. Um, and every month you take your excess income and let's just say you have $1,904 a month of income. So you have an extra $1,000 a month of income every year. You're able to take this income and put it into what we call a pooled income trust run by a nonprofit organization. Um, and every month that money comes in and then you turn around and spend that money on, you, on, on your needs, anything that Medicaid does not pay for. It has to go for your benefits so it can't go for your spouse's benefits or anything of that nature, but it is a way of protecting your excess income above $900 four dollars a month um, every month. Again, this only applies for community Medicaid, does not apply for, for nursing home Medicaid. 
then I really think it's important. It's not a planning technique or protecting assets, but many people apply for Medicaid and they're like, well, I've got a house. It's protected. It's under $900,000. I'm good. I qualify for Medicaid. And they're not educated about the state recovery. And just so you know, the, by law, the state is mandated to seek recovery from the Medicaid recipients and or their spouses of state for the money it paid for that person's medical care while they were alive. So when you, pa when you pass away, Medicaid is required to go after your estate. Right now, they can only go after your probate estate. That's the estate that passes through your will. Or if you have no will, could, they could go after your intestacy estate, anything that passes through the court. So what we try to do is make things so they pass outside of your will, outside of your intestacy estate. And in that regard, we put things into trusts. Um, we, I mentioned the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Sometimes we also reuse living trusts or called revocable trusts. Uh, and, and I didn't put that in the slides because it's not a planning technique to protect your assets for Medicaid, but it protects it from a state recovery later on because, again, it allows the assets to pass outside of your will. We'll also update beneficiaries on exempt assets and accounts. Maybe you have a, I've had many clients that got a million dollar 401k and the principal is protected. Um, but the, the income's not. So we get their income, we put it into a, a, a pooled income trust. When they pass away, we do not want that retirement account to be payable to their estate because Medicaid will get a state recovery. Um, but we allow that uh, asset to pass to the named beneficiaries outside of Medicaid's um, hands. So it's a way of protecting your assets and allowing your loved ones to benefit um, from your assets after your passing. And then we also transfer assets, as I mentioned before. We always say do this with caution and seek professional advice, because while, yes, we could transfer everything now and apply for Medicaid, community Medicaid, the very next month, we always have to keep in the back of our head what happens if I don't make it five years and I need to go to a nursing home and I need all my money back and have to engage in some type of nursing home crisis planning. So if you're going to transfer assets, do, do, do seek professional advice and make sure you're, what you're doing is proper and can be undone if needed. So now that we've planned your assets, we can apply for Medicaid. Um, and so I just want to go briefly run through a Medicaid application. People will say, okay, it's quick, it's easy. It's a lot more complicated than you think. There's the Medicaid application. There's the Supplement A. There's multiple authorizations that you have to fill out, sign, uh, and submit to Medicaid. But then you also have to obtain all the, or all the information and documents they want. And, and this is not in any way a, a, a complete list, but they want a photo ID. They want all proofs of all of your income. They want all proofs of all of your assets and resources. They want all of your health insurance documents. These are the front and back of the cards. They want to know what the premiums are. If you're married or, or widowed, they want a copy of marriage certificate, death certificate, all of your outstanding medical and pharmacy bills, if you have any. Um, if you're going to use a pooled income trust, they're going to want proof of disability that you're entitled to use a pooled income trust. And when we gather all of these documents, all these information, fill out all the multiple forms, then we have to submit it to DSS um, that up here in, in Westchester, New York City is HRA. Each county has their own term for social services um, and wait for them to get back. And only once that application is submitted, and normally you hear back 45, there's supposed to be 45 days, quite often it, it's longer than 45 days. Then the, what I call the real fun begins. And um, that's when we turn it over to Debbie um, or Deborah, who's going to talk to you about geriatric care manager, because once we get that application submitted, it really is important to work with a geriatric care manager who's going to walk you through the next, next steps of obtaining and qualifying for care, which could take sometimes up to four months once the, the application was completed and submitted till you receive care. So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Debbie, um, who's going to talk from the geriatric care manager side of actually getting you the care. Okay, thank you, Brian. That was really a very comprehensive overview. Um, I want to just emphasize, and I always joke around about, I love New York because we, I cannot emphasize enough. I don't know if we have anyone on with us this evening who does not live in New York State, but um, it is unbelievable how generous New York has always been in a completely unique way. 
I get calls all the time from uh, people who will say, you know, I have a sister who lives in Florida or in California or in Maryland, and it would be so much nicer if mom or dad or Aunt Tilly could go live nearby. The reality is, is that New York State is where you want to be as you grow older to be able to really benefit. So even though I talk about the glory times changing, even with all the changes coming, the fact, as Brian shared about the ability to use something like an irrevocable trust, it does not exist in the other states in the same way we can, in the same way currently that one can transfer assets, it does not exist. So I would say, I love New York, keep that in mind, try and plan as you're planning, you know, for your future or your loved one's futures to think about the fact that even with these tough changes coming and our broken system, which I always refer to it as Medicaid is a stupid broken system, but thank God for it because um, it really, as Brian said, really is the insurer of, you know, pretty much last resort for the poor and the middle income. And um, it's, it's, it's very, very important. I also, before I get into some of my slides, I wanna just, again, encourage you to seek professional help to do this. I cannot tell you how frequently I will get a phone call from someone who will say, well, you know, my neighbor told me that their cousin's mother was able to get, you know, split shifts of care and, you know, they just transferred everything over and everything is great. And I, again, because there are changes coming, we know that they are coming. We don't know exactly when. Hopefully the pandemic, you know, will ease some of the burden on the government systems, but we have to assume that there will be issues and some of these issues could be very expensive mistakes that people make. It's worth the money, meet with the professionals. Littman and Crooks is a great firm. They've been in business for many, many years. Um, do it, do it, do it, do it. So I just wanna to emphasize to start with that. So again, times are really changing. And I think that a big part of it, this is before the pandemic, our now former governor, Cuomo, had looked into, this was his second round of revamping the Medicaid home care system. It was first transitioned about eight years ago. Um, there was this Medicaid redesign team and um, where they put together a group of people in the world of business, and healthcare to redesign and deal with some of the abuses that were going on. And as you would imagine, when someone is generous, like New York State was, there were definitely abuses. Um, what came out of the old system of what in those days felt like the glory times was our new system, which primarily involves managed long term care. And um, managed long term care was basically developed to have a goal of providing a comprehensive variety of services that would be overseen, the process would be overseen by independent nurses who would be able to use the same tool, we call it a universal assessment summary, a UAS, so that any nurse that is certified to do that would come to the same conclusion about any patient. So if one nurse were to see Mr. Smith who was bed bound, they would come to understand his needs to be the same as another nurse in a different environment. The reality as you would imagine is that also had its holes. And um, the goal of the program was to really try to again, eliminate abuses and to save money because it's a hard thing if you're very generous to be able to continue to be generous. So what we're seeing now and what we've seen from this whole redesign team process is a real overview of how many hours our clients are able to get. At times, 
it does not make any sense whatsoever, the, the amount of hours that people are approved for. And then of course, that's where some of the work that, that the elder law attorneys and the care managers and social workers, you know, at, become advocates for you. And um, it's very problematic. So how do you make it work? And on top of that, how do you ensure coverage during times of caregiver shortages? So I want to just share the fact that, um, especially the past week, something that has probably kept poor Natalie and Megan up and, and myself uh, worrying about this is there were already shortages of caregivers, of people who wanted to work in this field. The pandemic really, really had a major impact on this uh, between people not being able to work because they needed to care for their children who were at home during the pandemic for long, many months at a time to themselves being afraid to go out into people's homes, perhaps on public transportation to take care of patients. And, um, and of course the unemployment supplemental monies, which for about four months last year provided a population that primarily works for minimum wage uh, for $15 an hour. This extra $600 a week made a big difference. And then it was $300 a week. And the beginning of September, that went away. So there's been a tremendous shortage. And now we have the newest mandate, which came into effect last week of all caregivers needing to be vaccinated through licensed agencies. So we're facing tremendous shortages. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna talk you through the actual process of what happens in the beginning. In the beginning of the Medicaid process is the financial approval. Brian mentioned it takes about 45 days for the DSS or HRA office to do its magic go through all the papers, say yay or nay, ask for more paperwork, more explanations. And very frequently our clients will say, hey, we got the letter that said we're approved. When is the caregiver starting? Well, we're just at the next hurdle. We've gotten to first base at that point. So now that we're on first base, we have to figure out how to get the care in place that we need. And as I mentioned, with the changes in the Medicaid redesign team that occurred, most of our clients get care through an MLTC program, which stands for Managed Long-Term Care. And like you would expect when you hear that name, you think of almost like an HMO, something that limits, that has oversight with what you're going to receive. And so the government, AKA Medicaid, takes a lump sum of money each month somewhere between five and $6,000, gives it to an MLTC program. These are nonprofit organizations that are set up to provide home care supplies, you know, things like chucks and, um, and uh, diaper products and medical transportation, hearing aids, dental, um, it all comes under that one umbrella and it all is supposed to be paid for by that lump sum of money. Now you might say, gee, $6,000 to pay for supplies, medical transportation, a home health aid and other services. How's that possible? Well, what happens is, is that the MLTC program unfortunately has to absorb those extra costs. And you would imagine that they would like to not lose a lot of money. They prefer cases that are very limited in hours, um, if possible. And that's where our advocacy and fighting with them works and the appeals process. And um, at the MLTC level, even, they don't directly send out the aids. They subcontract to licensed home care agencies, places like InCare, where Natalie and Megan work. And... Um, they're the ones that first send out the caregivers. So you have a lot of levels. We took a broken system and we added multiple levels more of bureaucracy. Great redesign, they didn't consult with me. 
I'm not sure. Okay, I wanna to talk to you about a consumer directed program known as CDPAP. We have a lot of acronyms in this world of Medicaid home care. Who is this for? What are its benefits? What are its disadvantages? This is very valuable, this program for cases where you may have certain family members like adult children who are caring for their elderly relatives. And it enables them to get paid in order to do this. It enables situations where there may be a person who speaks a certain language and the family may have originally placed a private caregiver who can then be hired through this consumer directed program, which is wonderful. However, again, some disadvantages in that those caregivers, there, there, there is no backup. So for example, with a regular program where let's say in care is sending the caregivers, if that caregiver is sick for the day or cannot come in because they've had a death in their own family, what will happen is, is that hopefully a substitute will be sent in. It is not the case with consumer directed. Um, but again, for certain people, let's say if someone needs more skilled services like assistance with insulin, an aid coming from a licensed home care agency is not permitted to do that by Department of Health regulations. So this enables more people to sometimes get higher skilled levels of care. And the only real requirement is that the person has to be legal to work in this country and they get a um, annual physical that they have to pass. Conflict-free evaluations, that's the next step. Once you make a decision, what happens? We call up the Medicaid Choice Department in the state and we say, we have Jane Jones, here's her Medicaid number. We would like to arrange for a conflict-free evaluation where they will ask questions about her medications, her diagnoses, and her needs. And again, the goal being that any nurse that would look at this would come to the same conclusions. I have seen a wide variation on this. Um, that information goes into a central database. And, um, but again, the aids are not going to be sent out at that point in time. At this point, we then go to the MLTC programs that I spoke about and we ask them to please come in and do an evaluation. And that evaluation probably will take anywhere from two to three hours. They will ask the same exact questions that the nurse that was doing the conflict-free evaluation does. And they will ultimately make a decision or at least collect enough information that they could go back to their supervisors to decide how many hours the client is going to receive. Next, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. What happens, or before we get to this one is, and then at that point, if one is currently working with a licensed agency that they would like to continue with that has contracts with MLTCs, it's a very nice, smooth process, which again is, I believe, something that the elder law attorneys can help with, care managers can help with, to, very, to make the process very smooth to transition from the private pay to once the Medicaid kicks in. And we've said about 45 days for the financial approval, waiting for all these evaluations, unfortunately, sometimes takes a little bit longer. So we, we, we try and caution people and say, if we're lucky, three to four months, okay. So how do you get through all this? Because it's really, remember my expression, stupid broken system at times, but remember, I love New York and I'm very grateful for the system that we have because it does not exist elsewhere. So think about people like myself, care managers, social workers, they will help you figure out the right choice for you and to think outside of the box. Not every MLTC is the same. Some are known to be more generous. It may be necessary. If we have a client who is bed bound and will need a lot of hours, and if we know there's a particular MLTC that is not generous, we will want to kind of work with them to say, okay, let's use a company that we think will be more generous. 
we may wind up going to more than one. Think about it as shopping around. Go to more than one, see who comes up with the best offer. What we try to do also is coach our clients and the families for these evaluations, what to say. What to say, I often will tell people is not, I'm fine, I can manage on my own, or the kids to say, oh, mom just needs some supervision to make sure that she remembers to take her medicine. That is not what to say. What is to say is mom has had falls. Keep a log of how frequently that has happened. And that will really build a better case because that's really what we're doing is trying to build up a case to get the best possible outcome for our clients. Now, how do you choose a home care agency? How do you know what to, what to look for? Not all of them are the same. You want a place that is going to have available staff, first of all, available caregivers, and to have perhaps a designated coordinator that's gonna be available so that you're not just calling a general phone number and being bounced from person to person. Um, people that actually care about your loved one. So these are very important things to look for. Find out, do they have a lot of caregivers? Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so now what happens when you know, you'll have in your head, well, gee, Debbie Dreilich of New York Elder Care Consultants said, I love New York. New York's the best Medicaid place. Well, unfortunately, we don't always get what we want, like many things in life, but certainly with the Medicaid program. What we do at times is we have encouraged family members to supplement, you know, ours. So let's say if we have, again, Jim Jones, um, who was approved for six hours of care, but he really needs eight hours to make sure that he's receiving breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and someone to remind him to take his meds and someone to take him out for a walk and to give him a shower, and he only gets the six. It could be that the family can help. It could be that through the use of this pooled income trust, which is a little bit complicated, again, why you want to deal with your elder law attorney or your care manager to figure out how to make it helpful you know, to use excess monies that may be in there because we sometimes have worked with clients who've been living in rent controlled apartments, let's say in Manhattan for a million years and they may have had a big income. So a lot of money goes into the pooled income trust and what you don't use at the end of your life or if you go into a nursing home, pooled income trust now for the in excess income. Um, gets thrown, you know, sort of it goes to this nonprofit organization. So sometimes that could be used. Keep logs. I always tell people keep logs of medical crises so that in case falls, in case you have to go to an appeal or a fair hearing, this is your evidence, right? Like we've seen, you know, TV court shows, this is your evidence that you need to keep to build your case. Advocacy, again, through lawyers and care managers to strengthen your case. Consider maybe trying additional MLTC evaluations. Like if it happens, we've had clients who have not been able to get the amount of hours they need, even on appeal, even with a fair hearing. And what we may have to do is try out another MLTC. Remember, as I said, we could shop around. Um, we can ask for reevaluation because sometimes clients' needs change and generally not to get better, but um, frequently to add to their needs. Uh, next slide. Okay. What if more care is needed? Okay. This was, I think I am transitioning here. Am I correct? Over to Natalie. Yes, I believe Natalie. She Thank you, Debbie. Oh. Thank yeah. you, Debbie. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is really just going over, um, concluding what you both have contributed to. The reality is, is that the cost of care is only going to increase, and there are going to be more and more challenges with the availability of care. So our goal is just to bring awareness and, and hope that people tap into all the resources that they may need um, in order to get the right care. Um, so there are like 
Brian had mentioned, Medicare does not cover long-term care, but Medicare can sometimes be used um, if somebody is hospitalized or they're being discharged from a rehab, Medicare has, based on exactly what, what's covered and what the secondary insurance is, Medicare has a tiny allowance that they will pay um, for um, home care for a short time. It's usually between three or four weeks. It may just be a couple hours a week. Um, but the home care is wrapped around the skilled services that they bring in the home. So let's say Jin Jones is coming home from the hospital. Medicare will, will, um, will say, we want to make sure that you stay home and you don't come back to the hospital. So we're going to give you some nursing visits at home, some PT, some OT, some speech therapy. Um, maybe you need um, somebody to help you organize the medication. Um, and if you ask for now, they have often been, you know, when, when asked, have been able to authorize some hours of home care for a three or four week period post discharge. Um, there are other insurances to tap into also. Some people have a catastrophic policy um, and it's, it's recommended that these policies be reviewed ahead of time so you're familiar with what do they require, what, what are the, how do I become eligible to use this, uh, do I need to use a provider, usually you do have to use a licensed home care agency to use a catastrophic policy, what are the terms, how much do they pay, um, you know, we work with um, um, many unions, there, there is um, the, the United Federation of Teachers have, have a separate program designed just for their retirees. Um, and it's just good to tap into your own um, um, union program and see what do I have if I, if I need home care? How much can they give me? What resources are available? Um, like Brian had mentioned, you know, there are veterans benefits that we can tap into. Um, something um, that is relatively new is that there are a lot of nonprofit organizations in New York um, that offer respite programs. And what is that? Um, if let's say, for example, a daughter or a wife is taking care of the father or a husband and the, the, the caregiver needs a break from her, from her caregiving, um, you know, there are certain support programs, certain um, nonprofits that offer respite programs, and they tell the caregiver, we're going to send in a caregiver through an agency four hours a day so that you get a break, and we'll take care of this care receiver so that you get the support that you need. Um, we're lucky. I mean, I, I also love New York, and, and not only because we have Medicaid available, but also because there's just this, this vast amount of uh, nonprofits and organizations um, cater to the to the um, elderly population. Um, so it's very important to become familiar and be aware of what other resources are available should you need um, that supplemental care. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, Medicaid, as as has been, you know. Um, been evident in this discussion is that Medicaid will continue to to um, cut or or the system is just because of the amount of people that need the care and because of the the needs that people have um, people are 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 going to get less and less hours than they're expecting. So what do you do if you only get care? Uh, Medicaid only approves five hours of care. And and with advocacy and with and with the support, what if you can't supplement the care privately? What are the options? And there's really three areas that must be um, identified and addressed, and that is safety, social isolation, and medical oversight. And in the next slide, um, I'll go into a little bit of each. So it's amazing in in the six years that I've been in the industry. 
I've seen the, the growth of technology that has been introduced in the market for the aging population. Um, I mean, many people are familiar with life alert, the necklaces and the bracelets that alert EMS um, if cases an emergency. But there are even more sophisticated programs right now um, that are that are that routine that are designed to routinely check in on an individual who is alone at home um, using sensors and, and, and different technology. And somebody can set up alerts for medication management, um, fall risk, um, kitchen safety, um, seizure management, overnight care. Um, there is a, a, a program called Safe at Home that ma manages movement in the home. Um, and if, let's say, for example, um, there's an alert set up that um, if, if somebody's always getting out of bed 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. and there's no movement in the home, um, this technology alerts the, the family or, or somebody in the community who's keeping an eye on this individual to say, Something is wrong today. Give a call to give a call to um, your mom, your dad, your your niece, your nephew, wh whomever it is, um, to make sure that they're okay. Um, there are um, there are a lot of other tools. I mean, I recently saw um, a it it was a device that converted a regular bed into a hospital bed, um, and and this this enabled somebody who was living at home. Um, to to be able to live with with you know their their recent disability and 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 how to live at like how to manage their um, their health while living alone. So it's important to become familiar with the technology. And again, I think um, you know the fact that we live in New York. There's so many services out there. Um, there are also support groups. I, 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 I see sometimes on Facebook that there is these inquiries about, um, you know, somebody aging in place. And it's not about I'm looking for a caregiver. It's more about does anybody have a recommendation about what I can do um, for meals and what I can do about the medication? Uh, my mother lives at home and, and I live a thousand miles away. Um, there are just so many different resources to tap into. Um, you know, the senior centers, the religious institutions, the nonprofits, um, they all offer um, programs to eliminate um, social isolation and, and give our elders um, a lifeline, an emotional lifeline, um, physical health. Um, you know, there, I mean, pre-pandemic, there were, you know, a, a friendly visiting program where um, they had um, high schoolers or college students volunteering to to visit, and and not not once in a while I'll visit somebody once a year. But this these programs are designed um, to keep an eye on somebody who's living alone in the community. Um, I know, for example, Dorot is a wonderful organization that we've all worked with, and they have a program where they call almost every day at the same time this individual so that they can identify if something is wrong. If they're calling and somebody's not picking up the phone at 7 p.m., at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., something is wrong. If we haven't been told that this, this individual is not, is, is not going to be home, then something is wrong. Um, you know, the, the Alzheimer's Foundation, uh, the Parkinson's Foundation, they all have a wealth of information that they can provide. A lot of them have Case management. Um, they, they, many programs, um, neighborhood programs, um, deliver home delivered meals, um, counseling. Um, so it's important to identify what is available in your community and what's available um, to your loved ones and for yourself, um, because it's just going to continue to be important to tap into these resources in your community. Um, and lastly, the medical oversight, um, because of the pandemic, um, you know, we saw an exponential growth in, in telehealth, in doctors making visits remotely and, and, and assessing somebody um, from a phone call or from a Zoom call. Um, but there are certain programs in New York that are designed to actually bring the medical, medical care at, to your home. Um, this can include 
um, doctor, uh, dentists that do x-rays at home, um, you know, lab technicians that do the blood work at home, um, you know, they are um, um, ENTs that come to the home, um, and, and all of these programs sort of have a, a, um, a larger and extended care team um, that provide more insight. Um, and they too value the, the role that a professional, that an elder care attorney or a geriatric care professional bring to the table. Um, you know, there are so many things that, there's so many things that have to be navigated. Um, medications that change, somebody to help with the medication and to um, coordinate with a pharmacy to make sure that they come in easy blister packs. Um, so, you know, there, there are so many programs in New York that are available. Um, again, it's just important to become aware of what those resources are, how you can be eligible to use them, um, and, and when, when, when is it the right time to, to um, begin those services. Next. Uh, this is just a summary. Um, there is, our goal is to bring awareness and, and educate and, and tell people and teach people more about the resources that are available um, and make people evolve. Um, there are even programs um, that are designed for, again, like respite services or well or, or groups for the well spouse. Um, it's good to become involved in, in these conversations and make that part of your long-term care plan. And it really is never too early to plan. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Natalie. Thank sure. you, Debbie. Thank you, Megan. Uh, this is now our question section, and I'm going to read through the. Please, if you have any questions, type them in. I'm going to skip to uh, go our disclaimer real quick and put our information up there. Then I'll read through the questions so that we can write down our contact. But I just want to remind you that nothing in here is construed to be legal advice. And we do recommend you consult with an attorney um, before relying on any information you learned here because today it is really for, for educational purposes and does not create any type of attorney client privilege, nor does it create any type of contract um, with in care or, or New York elder care. Um, if you do want to reach out to us, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. All of our contact information is here. As I said earlier, it really is important to put together a team when you're trying to age in place. Um, no one person, no one profession does it all. Uh, when I do Medicaid applications, I often really, really, really encourage, encourage, encourage my clients, seek somebody like Debbie, seek a, a geriatric care manager, because they're going to be the ones that really advocate the medical aspects. And I'm like, really seek out Natalie and Megan. You want to figure out who your home care is, because you want to find somebody that's going to accept Medicaid or going to accept your long-term care insurance. Or if you're private paying, you're going to want to find a reputable private pay person um, that you know. And so it really is putting together a, a team. And I think, you know, I don't know if it was Megan or Debbie, somebody said earlier that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, then it takes a team to, to age in place. And it takes a team to care for your parents and, and your loved ones. So while I say that, I'm just going to go through uh, some questions are coming in. And I will not read out your names because some of them are coming to me privately and some of them are to everybody. But first one I see, and this is really a, a question for me, um, and you know who you are, I'm not going to call you out by name. It says, can I or should I use an asset protection trust if I have a disabled adult child who is a beneficiary of a third party SNT? I want to make sure that as much of my assets as possible will eventually be available to my child. And, and, and this is a question I really recommend that you, you contact our office to schedule a meeting or consultation, because yes, you can use a, a, a third party SNT to protect those assets for your adult child. But I'd want to know a little bit about more about you and if you have a spouse 
your age is, what your assets are, because for Medicaid purposes, if you yourself need care and it goes into uh, SNT that is not a sole beneficiary trust, Medicaid can impose a penalty period. While you are able to transfer your assets to a, a disabled child um, that would then knock him or her off of their government benefits, or you can transfer it to a sole benefits trust, which is akin and similar to a third party SNT, but it does have some pay payback requirements for Medicaid. So I'd want to know a little bit more about you, your assets, your age, um, your child's needs, but uh, to know, is it just a straight SNT or do we need to consider a possible sole benefits trust as well? Um, will you distribute the slides to the attendees? Yes, if you contact, uh, if you have, you have my email at the bottom or if you email mbrill, M-B-R-I-L-L -L, at Lipman Crooks, um, we can convert the slides into a PDF and distribute them if you'd like. Um, can, we get a, can we get a slide with the contact information? That should be up right now. Um, so you have all of our contact information. Please, like I said, it, it takes a team and maybe you're at the stage where you need, uh, you've got your plans done in place, but you need a geriatric care manager. You need a home care. I mean, it doesn't matter where you are in, in the process. You want to reach out to, to any of us as to wherever you are and needed. Um, what can a person expect to pay for working with an elder care attorney and geriatric care manager? I'm not going to speak on Debbie's behalf. Uh, I could only speak on my behalf and, and it varies. Every client is different. Every uh, family situation is different. Uh, we'd have to know more about you, your assets, your, your family structure, your life, um, because no two people's planning are the same, including I've got many cases where husband and wife have entirely different planning because the husband may have lots of retirement assets and the wife had nothing and they require different planning. So every, every case is different. I don't, Debbie, if you, I don't know if you want to chime in because they did also ask about uh, Jerry at your care manager. And I get that asked quite a bit. And I say, you got to talk to GCM because I don't like to speak for them. <laughs> right. I, I would say in the same way, you know, there are cases that we work with. Uh, I mean, we work like attorneys in terms of, you know, billable hours and uh, you know, there's a range, you know, probably anywhere from approximately $200 an hour and up, but the amount of time that is needed is going to vary by every single case. Then one more question, please, if you have more, please type them in, but I, I only have one left here and I'm going to defer this to, to Natalie, Megan, and even you, Debbie, I'll let you guys all chime in. If, what do you think about these special retirement homes that take care of you um, until the end? The, and they're the, and I think what they're referring to are these homes that you may go in where you start as assisted living, then you move to more of a, needed more care to the point where you actually are in the full nursing home. Do you want me to, I could comment on that. We don't have a lot of them in New York. They're called continuing care retirement communities. The idea of it, it for some people, is actually very smart. There, you know, you basically pay a large sum of money up front. Uh, again, it's backed up with insurance and very smart actuaries. You must go in independent because you cannot come in if you need a lot of assistance. And the assumption is that you will, you know, pay that large sum and then you'll pay a fixed monthly fee throughout, whether you are independent, whether you need help just with showering and medication, or to really like end stage memory care and everything in between. So it's, you know, if you have the money to be able to put an upfront, it's uh, they're, 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 the couple that exist are very nicely, you know, run and uh, certainly worth something pursuing, especially for someone perhaps as a planning tool who is, let's say, bought their house in Westchester and 1963 and um, it's appreciated and there's, you know, when they go to sell it, they, you know, could take a lot of cash out of that. That's something worth, worth considering. I think I'm going to just interject this Megan Lubkin from InCare. Um, these are special retirement homes. If you are looking at um, there were also in the New York vicinity, it was always in the past that you 
maybe have go in for independent living and you'd step up with adult living. I mean, assisted living, which was more for like hygiene, management, food, cleaning, um, assisting you in daily living. However, and then there was the nursing home, which was totally at the skilled level where you're not bedridden, but you really need med medical supervision. New York has made more, there are more developments in creating a, a level in between. So you can go into, whether it's in the suburbs or whether it's in Manhattan, you can go into something independently that you're just having the food and then go to the assisted living with different services from, you know, everyday help with dressing to incontinence management. However, there is now an enhanced license where these places can now um, take you up to the point, which is close to a nursing home, that if you require some medical supervision, they will have a nurse on staff 24 hours and that they can administer insulin or deal with a catheter or other types of intervention that require more of a medical, you know, um, a medical professional involved. And if say you should have the problem that within your um, aging process, you are having cognitive difficulties, they will go out onto a you know memory unit which has many assisting in daily living along with helping within the advancement of some of these cognitive diseases and i think in new york you're seeing one or two of these aging communities that you've talked about that you'll buy into that have these services that you'll pay monthly throughout, you know, and at the end you might be receiving money back from as you're no longer living in this with the home or whatever. But there are more options that they were. And, you know, states like Florida have had maybe because of all the aging. Um, individuals there and the golden population, they have always had what we call these step down units. But I think New York and outside of the city, there are things that are starting to exist, but they are more in a community versus buying into a development that caters to your needs. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, actually, I got one more question. I was just about to wrap it up, but I got one more question. So uh, when working with a home care agency, what kind of supervision oversight is provided? Yeah. Natalie. Uh, yes, I was gonna say Natalie. Everybody, everybody else has spoken. We'll let Natalie get the last word. Um, it's a great question. So a licensed home care agency is regulated both by Department of Health and Department of Labor. That means that every care plan that we have, every client that we have, um, there is a nurse, there is a director of patient services that, that is reviewing these care plans to make sure, hmm, is this, is this truly safe for the patient? Um, do they need to, do they need um, some skilled services? Is this outside of our scope? Um, so there is a nurse, not a hands-on nurse that, that goes to the home, but there is a nurse who is reviewing the charts and, and all that. Um, the employees, the caregivers, the regular home health aides and um, personal care assistants, they are our, our employees and they work under a license. Um, so, so they all have to be trained by the agency. Um, they all are, are um, registered with the Department of Labor. So every employee that we have is registered with like a universal database. So God forbid, if an employee that we are hiring um, has something on their record that would, comp that would be questionable, 
um, there's communication that we have both with Department of Health um, as well as the other agencies. Um, because of our the license agency and all the regulations, um, you know, we are able to see, let's say, for example, a caregiver on our team, one of our team members, um, clocks in um, on a case at 8 a.m. Um, if for some reason the same person, the same employee that's registered, that's on the registrar with, with um, Department of Health, if they are clocking in during our shift somewhere else, we both get alerted, both our agency and the other agency that they're that they clocked in get alerted. Um, and this is this is really it's it's designed to protect our clients um, because it's a, it's a very big system. This is a, a, like human capital management. There's so many things that we have to manage. Um, so we do have this oversight and we do know that 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 we must verify that this that this individual is in the home and providing services. Um, there are a lot of com compliance issues. Um, I, I don't know if I addressed everything. I'm thinking if there's anything else um, that I can that I can add to it. Um, I'm going you know, to just go ahead, um, Megan. hi, it's Megan, and I'm going to just interject a little. When you're working with the home care agency, also the oversight is getting to know the family, getting to know what the needs are feeling that a situation isn't providing, you know, the care as somebody's care needs are changing. With the oversight, as the agency sees something like that, they will make changes. They will have, you're hoping who you work with, you'll have a seamless conversation because needs evolve. So the agency will be involved in addressing that, addressing any of the concerns you have or changing needs you have, you will have this dialogue with the agency who will orchestrate and implement. So there is always someone to have a conversation with and to, because they are taking care of, it's sort of like a marriage, a caregiver with a client. You want them to feel like they're married. They might even fight at some point but you're trying to look for that type of relationship. And sometimes it takes some changes, but with an agency, you can have that. And where agencies are used to these type of looking at situations and making changes and making sure that you're happy with the type of care you're receiving. Thank you, Megan. Uh, with that being said, I, I want to thank everybody for joining tonight. Um, as you know, see, this is a very intricate uh, process here, and, and there's many moving parts. Uh, whether you're planning for long-term care or you're in the midst of long-term care, it's important to put your team together. Reach out to Debbie, reach out to Natalie and Meg, reach out to myself, and, and put that team together to make sure that you are maximizing the care that you want to receive, maximizing protecting your assets, maximizing everything to, so that way you can age in place um, and are not forced into some type of facility where you may not want to be. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Debbie. I want to thank Megan. I want to thank Natalie for their expertise and taking all the time to put this program together and then, and, and then putting it out there to you guys. Please reach out to us. We all love to help. We all have family members in your situation, whether you're the person getting the care or the person that's caring for, for the loved one. We've, we've all worked in your shoes um, and we all know the different professionals in, in this field. Um, we, we know all the Debbies, we know all the Megans and Natalie's. So we were able to put together a team for you uh, and provide that care. Any final remarks, Debbie, Megan, Natalie? I, I count silence. <laughs> well, thank everybody. The for only coming. thing I could say maybe is don't let this scare you. It's just education and giving you a framework that it is time to educate and even get involved in maybe an organization that might be helpful to you in the future. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming Thank and uh, please reach out to us with any questions or, or things you may have. Thank you very much. Have a good night.